You're listening to the All Night Society, an actual play podcast brought to you by Queen's Court Games. Ah, well, that wasn't so bad. Miss LaRue, how would you say Elysium has treated you so far? Uh, you know, generally, I think I would say that I've had better Elysiums, actually. Thanks. Come on now, it wasn't that bad. It's not like a member of your coterie took someone off a balcony, anything like that. Alex seems to have been dead alive. We were worried about that. You're right. We were worried about that. But now, I'm a little more concerned about the fact that I have been forced into complete and total responsibility for Alex. So if he fucks up, goes off and does his apex thing, or <sighs> breaches the masquerade in some way, that's a reflection on me. At least Josh throwing that anarch over the railing was funny. This? This is not funny. Fair. Fair. Well, it's not the first time that you've walked into Elysium with nothing else but your own obligations to tend to, and left under orders from somebody older. That's the way it goes when you're kindred. Is that the way it goes when you're kindred, or just when you're me? Because in the short time that I've been part of this coterie specifically, it feels like there's been an awful lot that's been thrust on me and an awful lot not being thrust onto other people. I understand why you might feel that way, but let me posit a question. If other people were being obligated into secret boon relationships, would you see it? What's to say that Dozens of vampires that night weren't called upon to do this or the other, and you just don't know. Well, I... Uh, fine. Fine. I guess maybe you're right, but that still doesn't make it suck any less for me. No, I'll give you that. On the scale of how bad things suck tonight, Alex, congratulations. They're going to let you live. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I get to live. That was, that was, uh, I did not know the dead could feel stress. I'm very happy now. <laughs> very, very happy. I don't think now you can appreciate it, but in time you will have the opportunity, learning the way that others are handled in front of the court, to appreciate just how simply your exchange with Mr. Kevin Jackson went. Seems he was eager to have some of your talents and enthusiasm, we'll say, on his metaphorical payroll. You know, uh, the irony doesn't elude me. I got into this life because I wanted to make myself something better, improve myself, become someone that could do amazing things for people that needed my help. And now I'm doing that for a vampire prince of Chicago... I guess you could say it's a glow-up. Well, let's see what he has in mind for you, what kind of things you'll be asked to do before we get excited about it, hmm? Yeah. Yeah, it'll be fine. I'm sure it's simple stuff, you know, like grocery shopping. I don't know. Grocery shopping, in this case put in massive finger quotes, is what you caught Schmendrick doing, and look how that turned out. You sure you want to volunteer to be Prince Jackson's grub hub? Well, if there's one thing I've learned in the nine days that I've been a vampire, it's that even the DoorDash people have hidden agendas and dark secrets. I'm sure whatever I do, it's going to be absolutely terrifying. That the spirit? Ivy, see? He gets it. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks. Mm. Well, on the topic of secret agendas, Ivy, you've been given a mission by Rosa Hernandez. 
You have also been given a name and a location because, let's face it, it would be incredibly rude, even by vampire standards, to send you out to O'Hare Airport without a little bit of backup. Alex is strong, you're smart, but those two things alone can't hold back the lupines. No, and the only person in our coterie that could have even stood a chance fucked off a while ago. And might I add, this was her boon, so... <sighs> fine, it's fine, it's fine, but yes, definitely need help now. A little bit of a pent-up feeling there, huh? Yeah, I don't like owing people boons for any reason. So to have a boon called in for somebody else that suddenly becomes my responsibility, I'm even less inclined to be okay about that. And this is the second time it's happened in less than two weeks. So yeah, just a bit. There are some who would argue that you have also benefited from Jason Newberry's removal, but we are out of Elysium. I will leave the politics behind. Besides, you have other work to tend to. Well, Ivy, the directions you were given, the address, whatever it was that will lead you to where you need it to be, they're a little ambiguous. There's someone you need to meet. There's a place that you need to meet them. All you know is that somebody named Calamity is waiting, hopefully, not to introduce you to their namesake. This is normally the occasion where I would describe for you the location where this meeting is to happen, and it is critically important. Meetings for the first time among vampires are dangerous enough. This one happening outside the urban ring of Chicago that you call your stomping grounds. But given that it is so momentous an occasion, I will give the pleasure of describing it to our guest. Calamity, you're not one for cities, you're not one for meetings, but you have the opportunity now to ensure that Miss LaRue and her entourage meet you on your turf. So will you describe for us the location that Ivy and Alex arrive at at the appointed time? Well, I surely can, storyteller. This duo is going to roll up into one of those industrial parks. The kind of thing that you see all over Middle America with uh, half-abandoned warehouses, broken asphalt, broken street lamps. Plenty of places to uh, duck in and hide or sprint to, should things go pear-shaped. Always have a backup plan. But under one of the few unbroken street lamps is a car, and it's a beauty. 1967 GT, custom black paint job, obviously. Seated on the trunk of said American muscle is a kindred. Five foot six, surprisingly muscular, and you can tell it even under the denim and flannel. I think the phrase someone once said to my face was, uh, built like an oak table. I'm going to take that as a compliment. There is good quality denim on the legs, good quality flannel up top, and a pair of steel-toed Doc Martens that are just scuffed enough to where you can see the uh, steel poking through. Of course, can't go fighting werewolves in soft toe shoes. Of course not. We do things by OSHA standard here. Mm-hmm. And there's a cigarette, the uh, cherry red end, just casually glowing as I sit here and wait for these city slickers to give me my fucking job. Well, city slickers, I will let you out of the car to meet Calamity in a moment, but I have two questions. The first is for Ivy... Do we think you know who this person is? Would the name have rung any bells? I suppose that's a question we can let the dice answer, hmm? Sure. Will you roll intelligence and politics for me? That's three successes. 
Well, in Three Successes, you would have heard a rumor, at least, about Calamity Madden swearing allegiance to no prince, to no sect, a single-minded anti-werewolf force. Famous is the wrong word. We'll say well-known for hopping from domain to domain, helping various princes and primogen with their werewolf problems, and ensuring that wherever you are in the Midwest, the line against the Garo is held. It's not all good news. As prolific and powerful as Calamity is, she also has a way of, uh, rankling feathers. The Anarchs hate her because she tacks towards the Camarilla. The Camarilla are not so much a fan of very powerful kindred who don't belong to them officially. But power is power, and in the werewolf hunting business, there are few who can rival her expertise. At the point where you find yourself in a city that requires Calamity's assistance, you're not really in a position to pick at her politics. You know what I mean? I do, actually. And, I mean, I wouldn't talk to Alex about this because obviously he doesn't know who I'd be talking about, but I have to wonder to myself if that's maybe why Rebecca was brought here. Somebody that could theoretically join the Camarilla and have a similar skill set. Potentially, her presence could have made Calamity's, uh, I don't know. Unnecessary, perhaps, the word you're looking for? Yes, but that feels like such a stinging word. Yeah, we'll keep it between you and me. How's that sound? Sure. Well, time will tell if you find Calamity's presence more enjoyable than Rebecca's. At the very least, there don't seem to be as many birds around. Thank God. Hmm. Better for your car this way. So much better. Alex, we both know that you don't have the political acumen that would help you identify this person. Names are names, and the last week you've heard hundreds. So your question is a bit more personal. How do you feel about well-armed muscular women? Um, uh, uh, well, you know, it, it's, it's like a, it, it's one of my types, if I'm being honest. Well, the moving the two of you, that is going to set up quite the interesting tone as you pull into the parking lot of this industrial facility. Quiet now, in the early hours of the morning, the various union workers having departed for their homes. A skeleton crew of cleaners on the inside and three vampires conspiring in the parking lot. You know better when meeting new kindred to pull right up next to the car. That's not how this works. So there's going to be that long cinematic walk across the barely lit parking lot. Alex flanked by Ivy, Ivy flanked by Alex, all the while under the watchful eye of a stranger. Calamity, are you the kind of person where first impressions matter? Eh. That's politics. And politics have always been kind of fucking boring to me. But I'm a little petty. They need my help. They can come to me. I expected nothing else. Well, Miss LaRue, Mr. Scott, describe for me the tone, the tenor, the kind of step you're taking as you cross the lot into a new adventure. When we first pull into this place, I, I will admit, before even getting out of the car, I'm taking a couple extra looks around, because the last time I was in an industrial area like this, I had one of the worst nights in recent memories. So... You got shot. I did. A lot. Actually, so, you know, very hopeful that the same thing does not happen tonight. But I need to squash all of that down before I meet Calamity, because I can't project this sort of nervous energy. It won't get us anywhere. I imagine not. Hopping out of the car, I close the door and just start striding across the parking lot. Alex will keep up, I hope. Alex, do you keep up? Absolutely. If for no other reason than either A, I want to try and look intimidating with numbers on my side, or two, 
Um, I have no idea what I'm getting myself into. And so far, uh, Ivy has kind of been a mentor of sorts. Uh, and, and on that note, I, I definitely feel a sense of great trepidation, nervousness, uh, other words I learned for the SATs, and I'm trying really hard not to show a single one of them. I'm still a little excited, anxious from Elysium. I've been alive like this for a week and a half. The day that I was killed and brought back from that death is still very fresh in my mind and very recent. And this blow for blow is very similar in a lot of ways. So I am... Yeah. Anxious begins the sentence to how I feel right now. Well, it's not all bad news. I know you'll be happy that there's much less oil processing equipment around, and Alex, there's not a shipping container for miles. So, got that at least? Yeah. That fact is actually incredibly calming. I just, my only regret is there's not more farm equipment that I can throw at my problems. Ah, give it some time. We'll see where it goes. Well, then, Calamity, that is what you see. A tall, slender, obviously bookish. Goth vampires come in many flavors, but you can spot a Tremere when you see one. The other, harder to pin down, but what was the word you used last time, Alex? Lumber sexual? Yeah. Lumber Lumber snack. Yeah, lumber snack. That never going to catch a Ventru dressing like that. So you can already pin down the people who are approaching you. It's always a tense moment when predators meet. No matter how used to this you are, no matter how well tamed your beast, there's always that predatory feeling. Now, I'm not going to have anybody murder one another on the first. This is V5, not V20. But I will ask, just for flavor, can everybody give me a willpower roll? As you arrive within a few yards of one another, and that tension starts to set in. Oh, that's four successes. Calm, cool, and collected. Mommy would be so proud. Oh, yeah, she would. I had one success. Mm. Nerves aren't holding up as well as you thought they would. Or at the very least, you are revealing more of your trepidation. Was that one of the SAT words? More of your trepidation than you imagined. It's always interesting when you can smell prey coming. I believe that it's four successes. Well, there you have it. The dice tell the story. Ivy, Calamity... You are acclimatized to this kind of meeting, and if nothing else, the will to appear like you're in charge keeps the beast in check. Nothing quite so embarrassing as appearing too aggressive or too weak in the first meeting. That, apparently, is a lesson that Mr. Scott has not learned. Despite the best of efforts, putting on a strong face, you can see that little quiver in the aura, that slight hesitation in the step. The way he looks left and right just a little too often for someone who's confident in these kinds of meetings. But nevertheless, you arrive at that polite distance, close enough to make eye contact to read the features on folks' faces, shattered as they are by the light coming from above. Which leads us to the next question, who speaks first? Oh, I know how these games are played. We are coming to her. She sat on the trunk of her car the entire time. Didn't attempt to make a move. No, we have to speak first. So as we close the gap, and I'm close enough that she can hear me without me having to raise my voice above a normal level, I say, Calamity, I presume? That would be me, darling. I'll sit up a little straighter. Uh, Take one last pseudo drag on the marlboro it's one of those habits that i was never really able to kick but uh what are you gonna do i will toss the glowing cigarette butt away from me 
I mean, they say it'll kill you, but that's not something you have to worry about anymore, is it? It's really not. Once I'm sure that I have her attention and it's not on the cigarette any longer, I give a little bit of a smile, trying to tone down the predator, right? And I say, pleasure to meet you. I'm Ivy LaRue of House and Clan Tremere, and this, and I'll gesture to Alex, who's looking more nervous than he did in the car, which I was not expecting to see. I thought maybe he could hold it together just a little bit more, but I will throw him a very quick look and shake my head a little bit and continue. And this is Alex Scott. I'm going to slide myself down off the trunk of the car, get a better look at these two. Avi... Well, this girl looks like she's never so much as broken a fingernail, but Tremere have other uses. And her friend, uh, this youngin is nervous and I can smell it on him. As previously stated, I am a little petty, so as I approach, there is a bit of a predator in the way I walk. They get a better look at me as I pass through the streetlight. A black woman, coily dark hair, It's about shoulder length. I've got it braided out of my face on the right side, which also showcases the scar. Three scars, if you want to be direct about it. They cut across my right eye. Fortunately, the bastard that tried to take that eye missed, but it's a good reminder of what tangling with the Garu can get you. I give Ivy a bit of a sidelong grin, and I'll do the same to her little friend here along with a slow, up-down glance and a simple question. Do I make you nervous, Sugar? Hi, my name is Alex Scott. Alex Scott? And who do you run with? Um, I run with, uh, I, I, I run with, um, Ivy. I say, with a very weak finger pointing the person to my side. I slowly close my eyes as I bring one hand up to my forehead and rub it just a little bit as I mutter, He's a brew, huh? He's a baby. Yes, also that. Oh, that's sweet. Are we on double-digit days yet, Alex? Or not yet? Tomorrow? Yeah, tomorrow's tomorrow's my big tenth day of being an undead. I'm very Wait, excited. What? What? You're fucking kidding me, right? No, I wish. <laughs> oh, hey, but I'm not. Oh, and this is what Rosa sends to take care of this little problem of hers. Oh, that's good. That is fucking rich. I'm capable. I have had experience. I killed a guy with a shoe. Now, not just any guy. I think he was, I think he was a, a, what do we say? They're called kindred. I killed a kindred with a shoe. Yeah. How tall is Alex? I am 5'11", but I will, if you ask me, I will look you in the eye and I'll say, I am six feet. Oh, God. As this little baby vampire starts rattling off what I'm sure are accomplishments that he is quite proud of, I'll close that gap a little bit further. While I am sitting pretty at 5'6", and having to look up just a tad to meet your gaze, Alex, you might feel a little bit smaller. I absolutely do feel smaller. I feel, I guess, the same amount of anxiety or trepidation as the SAT words love to come to me right now. There is a powerful presence in front of me. I'm already so unsure of myself. Despite my accomplishment... And I am still way out of my depth. Ivy, will you will you remind me? There's something about about Alex and being challenged. What was that thing that kept coming up? Yeah, he doesn't really like that. It's kind of the uh, bane of his clan. Yeah. And here's this gangrel looking you up and down. Like you are a stake. Alex, roll willpower for me. Will do. 
Three successes on the willpower roll. Three successes. Ooh, just barely a success, but just barely. As you look down at this huntress, I can feel a small blip of adrenaline start to beat in my chest and like a piston pump and fire into the back of my brain as I look down upon her. I can almost feel my eyes begin to dilate as what, what could be described as a breath begins to quicken. I look down at her as I feel the beast begin to curl its lips, and I do mine as well as I say... Yeah. Yeah. It is a a fun little list of accomplishments. I know I'm just a baby, but you could say I'm a quick learner. (laughs) Oh, you're going to be fun. With a lip bite and a wink, I say. Oh, I hope so. Uh, Yeah, so we have a job. To do, I was told that I'm going to be using my my Bruja expertise for this. We'll call it expertise for now, sure. As Alex says the words expertise, you see me mock finger quotes just real subtly in the background. There's a there's a bit of a grin as I enjoy this little duo that I've been thrown in with. Yeah, you could say that. Did uh, Ms. Hernandez give you the rundown of what we're running into? Yeah, I mean, she's told us some things. I know there's at least three Garu that have been stalking close to O'Hare. Rosa didn't know if they were tied to the pack at Midway, but seeing as they're the closest Garu, it's kind of presumed. Only other thing is that they're probably keeping camp past Elk Grove. But that's all I got. Well, I can tell you for certain that they are not going to be the same pack. What we have is either a group that decided to shuffle down from the north and lay claim, or some runts who got kicked out of the midway pack and decided they got something to prove. Oh, fuck. That is way too many Garu in way too small a city. I agree on that, sugar. Especially because they're going to keep dick swinging at each other until somebody else notices, and that's just going to be a problem for everybody. So, um, just before we get down into the shit, do you two know anything about hunting lupines? I make a point of looking Calamity up and down, glance down at myself, back up to her, Gesture never mind. broadly. Nope, yep, nope, yep, never. That was that was a dumb question. That was that's on me. That's a dumb question. And this one's all of a week and a half old, so Yeah. I think the worst thing he fought before was the need to sleep. And a kindred who I killed with a shoe. I just feel like this is important. I don't know why we're glossing over that. Wait a minute. I I thought you were fucking with me when you said the, the thing about the shoe, what you're serious? You you killed a kindred with a shoe. With a stiletto heel, yeah. Alex is telling the truth. It wasn't that many nights ago that while running an errand, he ran into a gangrel who didn't quite like that he was on his turf and plunged the wooden heel straight into his heart again and again and again. For being new to the vampire game, Alex is actually taking well to the murder part. Yeah, Calamity, we ran into a little, uh, anarch trouble. I wouldn't worry about it, but yeah. Well, I certainly hope that won't be a problem. They're, uh, ooh. We don't get along great. Funny. I don't either. Hmm. Hmm. For slightly different reasons, I imagine. Sure, but I'm not gonna pry. We've only just met. Well, Alex, honey, you'll have to tell me how that went down, because I am just riveted, but... I'm assuming we would all like to come out of this with our unlives intact. I don't know about y'all, but I sure would. So, here is what you need to know. 
One lupine can very easily take on at least five kindred, so these numbers that we have here are less than ideal. Thanks for nothing, Rosa. You need fire, or silver, to take them on. Otherwise, they're just going to pop up and keep on coming. As far as their damage, what they are capable of, their fangs and claws will shred you like a wet paper bag. They will pull you apart and smile while they're doing it. Got it. Okay. Uh, so, now, I know that I am not the apex predator. There is something above me. Good to know. Um, second thought, uh, so I imagine we're going to be using tools to to get the job done. Do we have flamethrowers on, on hand? Alex, Alex, we hate oh. fire. Why would we have flamethrowers on hand? Okay, so no no flamethrowers is what I'm hearing. Good, good to know. Um, and we hate silver too. Is that a thing? Uh, you probably not. Me, definitely not. Some, yes, but most of us, no. No, that's a very particular squick, I think the kids have called it. But uh, as for the weaponry, um, and I'll, I'll hesitate. I'll look at Ivy. I'll look at Alex. I'll grin at Alex a little, but I will turn my back and return to the trunk of my baby. The hood will pop open and reveal a small arsenal fit for just such an adventure. It's like a scene from a Tarantino movie in there. Shotguns. Handguns, revolvers, machetes, and the parts of what look like a very high-caliber sniper rifle, all sitting pretty in the uh, immaculately kept trunk of this 1967 GT. I like the look. I'm imagining, like, LED highlights around it, yeah? No, 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 no. Nothing quite that fancy, but there isn't a speck of dust to be found. Oh, fair enough. These guns look... Super fucking cool. I I was never very good with with with, with guns. Uh, went to the shooting range, couldn't hit a damn thing. Uh do you got do you got like a sword or like a knife or something I can get my hands on? Just such a thing, sugar bean. And I will hand over one of the silver edged machetes. Ivy, as Alex is familiarizing himself with this new toy, you'd have a pretty good look at the firearms inside. If I recall correctly, the last time you saw ordinance of that caliber, it was beating down the Chantry door shortly before murdering all of your Chantry mates. Yeah, that is correct. Roll willpower. Fuck. <laughs> That is one success. Well, you're not going to frenzy or flee, obviously. You're in a controlled situation. This is more of the thing where that tremor comes across your lip, or you avert your gaze suddenly and conspicuously. Regardless of what form that takes, Calamity, you will notice Ivy's deep discomfort. It's not that I see Ivy flinch, it's that I see the hesitation. I tell her simply, honey, you're just going to have to get used to this. Nobody can go up against a Garu alone. Not even me. I'm typically the kind of kindred to leave the toe-to-toe -to -toe business to others that are more suited to that task. There are other ways to deal with Garu that don't involve dirtying my own hands. Well, I'm sure we can preserve your lovely little manicure, honey. It is lovely. Thank you. One of the benefits of Ivy's embrace. Her sire was quite adamant that the condition of the vessel be immaculate before being locked into its form for eternity. Take a look at the... Actually, Ivy, what do those nails look like? The night that I was embraced, I knew I had to show up looking absolutely flawless. 
I had to impress Gabrielle, obviously. So from the top of my head to the bottom of my shoes, everything had to be perfect. It was the early 90s, so nail styles weren't as crazy as they are today. No coffin nails, no ridiculous stilettos. But because we had just come out of the 80s, they were a little long, a little pointed, with a nice glossy black finish. It was a color my mother never approved of, but, well, at that point, I didn't care. So there you go. Calamity? You're going off to war with a perfect little goth princess. Lovely. And Alex, who at this moment I imagine is swinging the machete around like he's in a movie. Well, I've survived this far. And with more ragtag groups. You're all going to need to do a little bit of homework. My ears prick up when Calamity says homework. You, princess. See what you can do with your, um... And I make a... A hand gesture that can only be described as woo-woo. To keep yourself from, uh... Well, losing that pretty little head of yours. Sure. I have a decent amount of ammunition and, well, tools for those of us who want to get a little more hands-on. I'll give Alex a look at that. I am, meanwhile, practicing swooping cuts and katas that I think I've seen on, like, action movies. And it's not good. Oh, that's adorable. This isn't something that we can just jump into. This isn't something that we just run in and take care of in one night. We want to be prepared, or we will not come back to our unlives. You caught in what I'm saying? Slowing down to a stop, I look to Calamity, and I say nothing, but I nod very frantically yes. I think something inside me is excited at this hunt. I think I'm ready. <laughs> Good boy. And so it is that our meeting will come to an end. No doubt a few more small details to work out. But there's no need for us to get into the details right now. Ivy off to the Chantry, I presume. Alex, have a few more action movies to watch before we're ready to take that machete into battle. And Calamity will have the rest of the evening to wonder, which is better, going into battle alone or going into battle with these two? Not too terribly long, though. Two nights, maybe three. Because as I understand it, no sooner has Ivy met Calamity than she intends to pull her new gangrel friend into another Camarilla meeting. Being forced to parlay with the Thin Blood is one thing, but at least you don't have to do it on his turf. It's not the kind of meeting he would take normally, but this one comes backed up by the interest of a primogen. And Flyboy has not survived this long into the night, both literally and also as Lord of O'Hare, without knowing the difference between times you can push back and times you give in. So however you get his attention, phone call, text message, email, whatever it happens to be, when you tell him that Rosa Hernandez has requested his presence at a meeting, you can imagine him rolling his eyes on the other end of the line, but he will nevertheless... Agree. Tell me then, for your first off-campus meeting with the would-be Baron of O'Hare Airport, where are we meeting? Well, it's not the same gangrel as it would be before, but I think we can still use Rebecca's silos to our advantage. It's quiet. Nobody would know we were there. It's a pretty good place to have a secret meeting about secret vampire things. Also, you don't run the risk of some poor kind bartender looking at us like we're crazy. No, the three of you would make an odd pairing. Whether or not someone was listening, it would still be the kind of thing that sticks out in your head or you to be questioned about it later, right? Oh, but this gives it a certain enemy of the state feel. 
I cannot imagine that Ivy is the kind of person who wants to show up just in time for this kind of meeting, which means the two of you will have a little bit of time to kill before Flyboy shows up. That's if he decides to show up on time. He seems like the type who would try to flex about it. Well, of course he is. His head is far, far, far too large for the hat that he wears at O'Hare, but we must play nice. Remarkable, then, that he can fit it so far up his own ass. Indeed. Well, the head circumference to anal circumference ratio notwithstanding, I presume that is not what you're spending the entirety of your time discussing. Certainly. At the very least, we get there, and I have begun my rather useless ritual of casually chain smoking. Not that I need to inhale, not that I can inhale, but having something to do with my hands is certainly helpful. Having your hand occupied is nice. It's one more thing standing between you and strangling the unlife out of this man should something go not quite to your liking. I'm trying to retain an air of positivity here because we are here to ask for his help. And we're going to have to kiss his ass just a little bit, I'm sure, to get it. So, try not to strangle him. I, are you always this much of a buzzkill? And there is maybe a little bit of a smile. I kind of cock my head and say, well, I suppose it depends entirely on who you ask. If you ask me or much of the court of Chicago, the answer to that question is yes, but that is neither here nor there. Sounds to me like there's going to be no small amount of silent pacing between our Tremere and Gangrel friends as we await for the arrival of the thin blood with a head too big to fit up his own ass, I believe is how we've decided to refer to him. It, it, yes, that's that's how I'm putting it. I don't like him. He's a dick. For no reason. He's a dick because he is a man who believes he owns power. Trust me, I don't like it any more than you do. But having dealt with him fairly recently. You dealt with him before? Yeah. When Sierra Van Burris and her brother, Malenkov, first arrived in the city, it was up to me and Schmendrick and Rebecca and Josh, actually, to pick her up from the airport. Which meant dealing with Flyboy. I heard about that. Certainly made waves bringing the Lasombra into the fold. Yes, quite. Quite the trailblazer, if you'll pardon the language. Well, I can only hope that he will have forgotten that we chose not to give in to his extortion and will still have some desire to help us. I'm just curious about the cost this time. Favors and boons. It's what we live by, isn't it? Oh no, he wanted money. Really? A lot. That's boring. Yeah. What is it? Well, no, I, no, I answered my own question. I was going to ask, why is it that men, even men in their own life, have that level of ego? But as we all know, unlife takes the worst of us and makes it, well, worse. He's also a thin blood with no true power. What's that supposed to mean? He has to take it where he can get it. Well, on the topic of... Taking it where you can get it, you're going to have to make the best use of the next 40 or 50 seconds to get the last of your derision out of your system. Because assuming those headlights don't belong to a patrolling officer of the Chicago Police Department or a park warden or a couple of kids up to no good, your meeting with Flyboy seems imminent. Kind of cars you drive. Standard SUV, black, federal has airport plates, the kind that you park wherever the hell you want. There is mild judgment. And perhaps rightfully so. As the car gets closer, you can see that he has arrived alone, 
flyboy chauffeuring himself for the evening. He parks the car, call it 20 or 30 feet away from where you are. The engine turns off, but the headlights stay on. You see one foot and then the other landing into the gravel. It's the gentleman. Indeed, your business partner for the evening steps out. There is something profoundly judgmental as he looks around, surveying your choice of meeting locations. And then a shrug that you can only assume also carries some kind of snarky judgment. But we're all here on Primogen business, right? That requires a certain amount of politeness, and politeness you shall receive. At least as much of it as Noah Grewal is capable of. He's still wearing his business clothes from the day. A blazer, khakis. He spreads his arms. Well then, Ivy, a new friend. I am told one of the primogen has asked us to meet. Here we are. Flyboy, wonderful to see you again. Is is that it? Apologies. It was an attempt at pleasantries before we jump right into business, but we can jump right into business. If you don't mind. Rosa Hernandez has informed us that there's a pack of Garu encroaching on O'Hare. They're taking residents just outside. She doesn't know how many, anywhere from three to five, to make an incredibly long and dangerous story short. My colleague and I, and I gesture towards Calamity, are two kindred responsible for dealing with this problem. And we are here today to ask if you would be able to help. I see. Well, I have to say it's a bit of a surprise because I'm the one who told Miss Hernandez of the problem. Imagine my surprise now to find out that she has tasked it to somebody else. But I suppose that's the way of things. No doubt the result of endless machinations on the Primogen Council. Yes, yes, yes. Well, then how can I be of service to the court of Chicago and its lackeys? Really proud of myself for not rolling my eyes. As you work for the airport, Flyboy, I assume you have connections within the government. You could call in a favor. Get us a little bit of coverage, perhaps. There is, honest to God, shock and surprise on his face. And before he answers, he has to stifle back, poorly, a bit of a laugh. <laughs> well, uh, hang on a second. You, I, I thought this was going to be about some, some firearms, maybe some body armor or, or getting people to look at it. You want me to call the government? The uh, firearms and body armor is more my wheelhouse, darling. Uh, excellent i'm sure i'm sure you have wonderful taste uh, that that doesn't change my suspicion in like you you know who you know who's responsible for like a- airports right that's that's federal capital f federal yes i understand that airports are run by the capital f federal government and It's because of that that we think a little extra firepower in some way, shape, or form might be useful. Failing additional firepower, you could just keep the capital F Federals away from whatever it is we're going to be doing, because I guarantee it's going to be loud and it's going to be dangerous and we definitely don't need additional eyes so close to the problem. Oh, boy. You see him reach up to rub his temples. Well, you're asking for two different things. You want guns and ammo, or you want top cover? 
which do you think you'd be able to provide? Because I would hate to put you in a position in which you would not be able to give us a proper amount of help. Uh, to be clear, this is a problem that I can solve myself. I am not currently solving itself because it does not behoove your benefactor to allow me to do so. I'll burn the whole fucking forest down with the garrow in it, blame it on a homeless camp, let the news people figure it out. But this is your show. Mr. Uh, Lab, Lab Boy. You call me Mr. Growall. Mr. Growall. What I can tell you is that I have several decades of experience dealing with the Garo, pushing back their encroachment into the more civilized areas of this country. As Miss LaRue said, it is going to be loud and it is going to be messy. Uh, I think I am capable of making sure that we have the firepower necessary. My concern would be with it being that loud and that messy and that close to an airport. People are going to get twitchy. So. I don't know about. Look, if I tell them that there's something that's going to happen and it's big enough that it can be loud and messy, but not so big that they would need to get involved. I, I don't think that's going to fly. No pun intended. I mean, suppose 9-11 world, everyone's looking for a resume booster, and if they can say that they participate anyway, <sighs> I guess if I could get someone who thinks they're going to get a piece of the pie, something to put on their annual report, that might do it. How many of you were going? Three. <laughs> I'm sorry. That was rude. Three? Yes three well shit it doesn't matter what phone calls i make you're not making it out of those woods we've got some tricks up our sleeves that i think will prove otherwise and they haven't killed me yet well i hope so for your sake that both of those things remain to be true okay i can make some calls i'll tell them it's a, a drug thing or i don't know Put a scary name on it, just enough to have someone sniff around. A couple cars, maybe a helicopter, there's something else going on. It does. Not so many people that it would cause a huge stir, but enough to be useful. Based on what you've told me, I should go get the fucking 82nd Airborne to come in and three people. You know what? That That's between you and Rosa. I'll do what I can to make sure that... Uh, both of you and whoever the third is get to see another sunset, but yeah, I, all right. And that's, that's it. All right. What you're expecting me to make demands of the prince of the primogen. At the very least me. No, you're working for someone who, I actually need to stay on the right side of this time. Before it was just you and some punk bitch La Sombra here to ruin the city. This is different. Also, if the Garu decide that they want to encroach a little farther, I feel like it might be your ass on the line as well, Mr. Grewald. Maybe, maybe not. There's 340 armed federal agents in between the fence and where I live. I like my odds. Well, good for you. Okay. Well, how would you like us to get the details to you? Right. Uh, and he reaches into his blazer pocket, pulls out Nokia brick phone, and just chucks it in your direction. I will catch it. That's a burner. It's mine. There are two numbers in it. Both of them go to me in one way or another. No one's going to pick up. Just leave a message. Understood. Got it. Uh, three of you. I'm sorry I'm hung up on this, but three of you. Yes, three of us. And I'm one of them. I mean, 
a blood witch, a gangrel with considerable experience and firepower. That'd be me, by the way. Um, and well, he may be a baby, but at least that Bruja has got spirit and he is very, 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 very strong. I've handled him with worse. Just saying. Un- unless you want to come with us, Mr. Grillo. Uh No, four is also not enough. Thank you. But I'm just, just an glad. offer. Just an offer. Look, all I can say is I wish I had your confidence. But shit, if you if you pull this off, I I don't know. Platinum Sky Miles on me. I will be I will be pleasantly surprised. You don't much like flying, but uh, if we survive, maybe I'll take you up on that. We'll think of something. In the meantime, is there anything else? I'll look to Abby. No, Mr. Grewal. That will be all. Well then, he claps his hands together, palms flat, in that little approximation of a bow. It's a pleasure doing business with both of you. I look forward to the email. Be sure to let Rosa know that I was exceedingly cooperative. Oh, it will be my pleasure to pass on that message. Dear Peach, appreciate it. Good evening. And he tips his head in a nod and then returns to his vehicle. Gonna kind of watch as he gets into the vehicle. As that engine revs up, I'm just going to kind of lean over to Ivy. Is that too easy? And I smile and give a little wave to Flyboy in the car and say, without breaking the smile or looking away, oh, yes, much. Oh, good. Well, at least we're on the same page there. Yeah, he was a lot nicer than I thought he was going to be. That that already got a warning bell going in the back of my head. Well, far be it from me to look a gift horse in the mouth. Eh. Regardless of your skeptical feelings towards Mr. Gowal, I think he's made pretty clear that while he might not be afraid of you, Ivy, he's certainly afraid of Rosa. As he should be. Yeah, no, she's terrifying. Well, people with a tenuous grip on power often rely upon the good graces of their betters to secure their place in life. Or unlife, in this case. But regardless of his motives, Flyboy has agreed to assist you. As we get closer to the rueful day, we can talk more about what that means. But for now, we can call it a victory, yeah? Yeah, I would say so. I'll take those where I can get them. Very well. Then as Ivy, LaRue, and Calamity return to their own vehicle and off to the adventures that night still has in store for them, even though we may not, as of yet, know what those are. Preparation abounds for a monumental task. A small coterie of vampires asked to take on the great enemy at the behest of a primogen to whom they own a great deal. We'll see what Calamity brings to the table and how she intends to make the most of her new allies. But that's a story for another night. You've been listening to the All Night Society, an actual play podcast brought to you by Queen's Court Games. If you've enjoyed your stay, consider supporting us on Patreon for access to exclusive art, audio, and private fan-only games. For more content, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or TikTok at Queen's Court Games, or on Twitter at Queen's Court RPG.